welcome to our show tonight, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen, and we are broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. We want to thank you for inviting us into your homes tonight, and um, this is a telephone call-in show, and we would like to hear from you. If you have questions or comments about our subject matter, you can call in. Our phone number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820, and of course, if you would rather send us your questions or comments by email, you can do so at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. If you know people who live in the Boise, Idaho or Nampa, Idaho area that would like to see our show, they can watch a delayed program on Sunday afternoons from 4 to 5 p.m. on KCLP Channel 18 in the Boise area. And of course, live streaming video allows our viewers to watch us from around the globe. Um, and they can just go to our website, whatloveisthis.tv, and it's uh, on 8 o'clock every Thursday night, and it's a mountain standard time right now, but next month it'll be mountain daylight time. And, of course, all of our previous shows can also, <clears throat> excuse me, be watched or we rewatched on our website, whatloveisthis.tv. Uh, you'll also find book and DVD resources on our website, as well as links to other great sites on your journey to discovering the truth and the meaning of biblical salvation. A new film from Sacred Groves will soon be available. It's entitled Unveiling Grace. It's the story of eight individuals who, who have Mormon back, background traditions and they had personal encounter with Jesus Christ. You can pre-order your DVD copy at a ridiculously low price. Just go to our website for more information, whatloveisthis.tv or the website sacredgrovesonline.org. And then, of course, we have a support group. It's called Life After Polygamy. Our next meeting is Monday, uh, 6.30 p.m. That's on um, February 28th. And if you are in a polygamy group or have been in one or thinking of getting in one, you might want to come down and join us, grab a friend, and uh, just contact us for details. We'd love to have you join us. And to find more about our ministry as we work with polygamists and what we will do to help you if you need help. If you're in a polygamy group, you can go to our website, shieldandrefuge.org. We would love to help you. And we do have uh, a toll-free hotline. It is 877-425-9993. We offer you hope and a support system. And we want you to know that the true God is not at all like the God introduced and taught in the Mormon or the fundamentalist belief system. The true God does not and has never required polygamy or celestial marriage for any reason ever. Next week, we're going to, we won't be having a guest because we're going to be answering viewers' questions and special requests. We are also inviting and requesting anyone who has information about the suicide pact made by some in the Kingston polygamy group. We're giving you time to email us uh, so that I could perhaps read them on the air or email us to understand what's going on. Remember that no names will be made public. Uh, so far, we have received three emails regarding this since I've been talking about it on the air. And we will talk about those emails. Remember, nothing will be made public. But we don't know yet uh, the vital information, what we need to know. Uh, we don't know the who, the what, the where, or the when. But we do know the why. And we'll talk about that next week as well. So we would also like to know if the plans remain or if they have been called off. And time permitting, also next week, we're also going to discuss the FLDS or at least begin discussing, and how it got started, its basic leadership, some of the locations of the compounds of the FLDS group, and how Warren Jeffs, just like his predecessor Joseph Smith, has proven himself to be a false prophet many times over. So be sure and watch next week. We hope that you will enjoy the show and it will be educational and informative. I also would like you to remember that we have two disclaimers for this program. The first one is the word salvation does not mean the same thing in Mormon doctrine as it does in the biblical doctrine. Salvation means that we are saved from the torments and the eternal fires of hell before we get there and that Jesus is the only one who can save us from that. And our next disclaimer is that when we discuss polygamous doctrine, you need to keep in mind that polygamy began with Joseph Smith 
who began Mormonism. Therefore, if what we discuss sounds like we're talking about the Mormon church, the echo is there because it's from the same source. Doctrinally, polygamists are Mormons too. Our guest tonight was on our show December 2nd of last year, and we had talked at length about biblical evidence uh, about the practice of polygamy. He has served in several Christian apologetics uh, ministries. He's written several articles and letters and tracts defending biblical Christianity against organizations who claim to be Christian, but they're not. And so I would like to introduce our guest tonight, Rob Savolka, who is back to finish what we started and didn't get finished. <laughs> thanks for coming back again, Rob. Hey, thanks for having me again, Doris. <laughs> uh, we've got quite a bit to cover still that we had scheduled for last week. Yeah. But would you like to refresh our viewers' uh, memories about your ministry and maybe some websites that they can go to to find out more about what you do? Sure. Well, I am the president of Courageous Christians United. It is a, an apologetics ministry that reaches out to all different sorts of groups, different philosophies, religions, cults, all those that attack the Christian faith in one way or another. Living in Utah, of course, we specialize in Mormonism. Mm -hmm. My wife used to be a Mormon. She was raised down here in Utah County, and she came to know the Jesus of the Bible. And so we are reaching out to her family uh, and the rest of the state. We mm -hmm. want to see Utah uh, come to know the Jesus of the Bible. The, the true Jesus. Yeah, and, true so, and so that is our specialty. We we also reach out to Jehovah Witnesses. We have a website called uh, jwinfo.org for them. We have a website called muslim.info.org for Muslims. But our primary website is mormoninfo.org, in which mm -hmm. we reach out to the Mormon people. We do various uh, apologetic outreaches. We go in front of Temple Square on a regular basis to pass out tracts, to advertise our websites, to preach and dialogue with people. And we also do that in front of LDS seminaries right across from the high schools around mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And we go down to the Manti pageant here in June. We, we go all over the place mm -hmm. to get the good get news the out to people. Out. Yeah. Right. Now we also have a ex-Mormon meetup group. We had you there back mm -hmm. in October, I think it was. Mm -hmm. and. We have had Sandra Tanner there. We have had Russ East of Utah Partnerships for Christ. We've had Timothy Oliver. We've had Marv Cowan, who wrote Mormon Claims Answered. And uh, just last week, we had Dennis and Rowney Higley there. We had a very big group uh, there the other week. We had over 20 people. If someone wanted to, to go to that meetup group, the ex-Mormon support group, basically, how would they... Um, be able well, to you, you just go out. to meetup.com, okay. and you, there at Meetup, you find people of similar interests, and you get together over mm -hmm. whatever your interest is. Our interest is Mormonism, so, so you, you don't have to be an ex-Mormon to go there. Uh -huh. uh, as a matter of fact, last, last fall, we had a gal coming who was active LDS, and now I'm happy to say that she's uh, out of Mormonism and Good living deal. for Jesus Good now. Good deal. Great. But, uh, so it's just for anybody that has an interest in Mormonism and wants to find out about what uh, the differences are between Mormonism and Christianity because, mm -hmm. of course, we come at it from a Christian perspective, right. mm -hmm. and we, we make no apologies of that. Right, but, and the differences uh, are great, aren't Yeah, they? and we're not... in. You know, just relax. We're not going to force it down your throat or anything like that. But we have a particular perspective that mm -hmm. we like to share with people. And that's our Christian perspective. And we make it very relaxing for you. We, we put on a dinner. We provide the main course. And we ask people to come and bring a side dish or dessert. And then we have a speaker come and share how they got out of Mormonism and came to Christ. Yeah. Next month, we're going to have Ross Anderson, who's mm, the pastor yeah. up in Wasatch. He was Wasatch. here last week. He was our guest here last week. Well, there right? you go. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're looking forward to having him cool. there next month. Cool. He's got but yeah, you go to this meetup.com site, mm -hmm. and you just type in ex-Mormon. Mm -hmm. And you put in your zip code, if it's Salt Lake City area code, our, our uh, meetup will come up. It's, mm -hmm. a, okay. it's kind of a long link. It's meetup.com slash salt dash lake dash city dash x dash Mormon dash meetup. 
Okay. But you don't well, have to remember they, all that. They probably just, didn't get all If they could just go just to go to meetup.com meetup. yeah. and, and search for ex Mormon in the Salt Lake City area, okay. and we're there. Please join us and then RSVP if you can come. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, we have had people that have requested uh, information about support groups around the area and in Utah County, too, so that's good to know. Mm -hmm. Let's start where we left off in December. Um, we were talking about your website that has some information and dialogue about Old Testament polygamy. And um, I, what I want to do is my first question um, is also a question that I would like to challenge our polygamous viewers and our Mormon viewers uh, to maybe call in later on in the show with their answer to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, yeah. it's loaded with advice about marriage do's and don'ts and other guidelines mm -hmm. from, the, from God's perspective. And I would urge our um, Mormon viewers, our polygamous viewers, to read that chapter on a modern translation because you're going to get more out of it. But um, it explains how marriage is not a requirement for heaven it's not a requirement for exaltation. And so what I'd like you to do is comment on the teachings of chapter 7 versus the polygamist or Mormon doctrine on marriage slash celestial marriage. Yeah, it's, this passage is very clear that Paul has in mind what is best. Uh, he says here in verse 38, he says, So then, he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, uh, this, this is really hard, I understand, for Mormons to wrap their heads around. I mean, can you imagine a modern-day apostle uh, saying what the Apostle Paul said here, that yeah. not being married is it's, actually it's the best? Yeah. Not just good, but the best. Okay? It's better. Well, they've made a requirement for salvation, or at least well, a yeah. celestial... Um, Exaltation. Yeah, so look, if the temple ceremony, temple marriage is necessary for getting to be with God in the celestial kingdom, then of course we'd expect Paul to advocate mm -hmm. that everybody should get married in the temple. After all, uh, as Joseph Smith says in, in the Manti pageant, I don't know, have you seen the whole Manti pageant? I haven't pageant? seen the whole thing. I've seen okay, well, the about, first part of it. About 1030, about an hour into it. Joseph Smith gets up amongst the crowd and he clearly says what the most important thing is in his perspective. The most important thing is man's exaltation into eternal godhood. Okay? Well, how's that going to come about? Well, you need a temple marriage ceremony for that. All right? You know, 1 Corinthians 15 says uh, this is of first importance. It tells us yeah. right there what is first importance. And Okay, I'm sorry I didn't interrupt, but that just came to my mind. That's right. So, look, Paul had something better in mind than what Joseph Smith had, and that was getting the gospel out to as many people as he could. Because mm -hmm. of the present state of affairs, he said, it is better if you remain single as I am, mm -hmm. he says in the text. Mm -hmm. So, uh, from his perspective, it's good if you get married, he says, you don't sin yeah, if you get married. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with getting married. But no, it's, it's not a requirement. Exactly. It's not a requirement, but he had something better in mind, and that's getting the gospel out to as many people as he can. Because if you get married, you're going to be tied down to the home and, and having to deal with a lot of headaches at home. And that's honorable, he mm -hmm. says. Yeah. But there's something better in his mind, and that's getting the gospel out to as many people as he can. Unhindered, now, right. Now get this. That means the gospel doesn't have anything to do <laughs> with getting sealed in a temple marriage ceremony. Right. Right? Paul says several chapters later what the gospel essentially is, and that is that Christ died for our sins and rose again on the third day. And okay? that's where he said this is of first importance. Right. Not right. marriage, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. And notice the simplicity here. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Which, according to Second. Corinthians chapter 11 verses 3 and 4. It's Satan that wants to take you away from the simplicity that's in Christ right. Jesus. Okay? Absolutely. And so what the Mormon church does and uh, just Mormonism in general is heap all these regulations as, as part of the gospel. Mm -hmm. okay? If you mm -hmm. really want to be with God 
in the afterlife. You need to jump through all these hoops. And, and you know, that's what they say too. They say um, it's too simple. If you talk about the truth of the gospel to a polygamist or a Mormon yeah. or, or anybody that's not a Christian and they think it's all of these books and mm. doctrines and regulations, and they say it's too simple. Yeah. But the Bible says, yeah, it is simple. Yeah, and it's Satan who's going to take you away from and, that simplicity. And, and yeah, Satan and man, that makes it complicated. Right. And, and another thing, too, I notice in this chapter 7 of, of 1 Corinthians is there's nothing in the Bible, especially in this chapter, that uh, where God arranges marriages between people. And yet in the early Mormon church mm -hmm. and also in the present-day polygamists, they arrange marriages all the time, mm -hmm. which is just, uh, they dictate who, the, especially the girl, the woman is supposed to marry. And, of course, that's more proof that polygamy is gender prejudiced. Mm -hmm. And you don't find it in the Bible where God's ever commanded that marriages are arranged like that. Mm -hmm. I command the young girls to marry the old men and yeah. give them families. Mm -hmm. um, in, on your uh, website, you have a uh, review of a documentary by A&E on polygamy. Mm -hmm. And you posted a review of the documentary on, on that website. And I want to quote a, co a couple of comments that you made and ask you to elaborate. First of all, of course, I, it's, a, it's a long review, so I'm only uh, taking partial quote. But you said, interesting to hear how many polygamists said that God told them to obey his law of polygamy. Even though many did not want to, they all wanted to be obe obedient to the voice of the Lord. They claimed that polygamy wasn't for everyone. Now, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and etc. all taught that polygamy was essential for right. everyone. Mm -hmm. But they're saying in this film that it wasn't. So what is your, um, your the, the special calling? Uh, if God called someone to live polygamy but not others, doesn't that contradict his revelation of his character? Well, I would say, look, my, my understanding is God is quite clear that he is love. I mean, the title of this program is Polygamy. What love, what love is, is this? this? Yeah. <laughs> God is a God of love. So, look, uh, I don't see how God would think it's good and loving to bring others into a marital unit when by doing so, it would actually destroy the oneness that is shared by the original spouses. That he okay. commands them to share too. Yeah. He wants them to share it. So I, I think it would be an act of hate against one's own flesh and one's spouse if uh, God were to destroy. I mean, God, God said, what God had joined together, let, let no, no man, man separate. Right. Well, <laughs> you are separating it if you're adding more members to this, this mm -hmm. arrangement. That's right. And so God set it up in the beginning, not as a polygamous uh, arrangement, but as a monogamous one. That is the ideal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it is. Yeah. In the book, Under the Banner of Heaven, um, it's a very good book, mm -hmm. but if, and it focuses on the Lafferty brothers, basically. Mm -hmm. And the author, who was not writing from a Christian perspective, made the comment that if God actually spoke to the Old Testament people, mm -hmm. um, who's to say that he didn't speak to the Lafferty brothers to tell them to do the atrocious things they did? Now, he's not saying they should have done it. And he's not even saying God did speak to them. But being from a non religious, spiritual, biblical background, he's trying to weigh this up. Of course, from the Christian and biblical viewpoint, we know what the answer is. But let's talk about what's the difference between God speaking to the Old Testament prophets and God speaking to people today. And would he be speaking to the Lafferty brothers like he did? Like he claims he did. Well, I, th I think we need to keep in mind what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, when he says, If we or an angel from heaven give you any other gospel than that which you've already received, it's to be damned. You're not to listen to it. So we have our foundation. The we, foundation we the is guidelines. the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, The Word of God is a lamp unto our path, <clears throat> the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to... Uh, guide us. It's supposed to protect us from all these false prophets right. who are going to arise in the last days. Jesus and the uh, apostles were very clear in the last days, many false prophets, false Christs are going to arise. They're going to deceive many. Mm -hmm. And so we're supposed to steer away from these people by using the word of God as our foundation. As our test. Okay? Because God's not going to contradict himself. Absolutely. So if God is a God of love, if he established a 
uh, mona a monogamous relationship as the ideal. Okay? And if he tells us through nature, by just observing this, this uh, marital unit, that by adding more members to it, you're going to actually destroy it, mm -hmm. then we don't pray and get our bur burning in our bosom that tells us, well, go ahead and, and, and enter into this polygamy uh, because this is really what I have for you. Mm -hmm. This is really the way of exaltation. We can't believe this because God has already spoken on the matter. Right, absolutely. Now, the other thing to keep in mind here is that these LDS uh, prophets, uh, these polygamists, are claiming a, a revelation from a God that you and I both know doesn't exist. Right. Amen. He's an imaginary God. He, this, this is, Mormonism is an idolatrous system. It's based on a God who is not the God of the Bible. And God has given us a test in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Mm -hmm. But here specifically, he's talking about how, how are you going to know a true prophet from a false prophet? And he says in chapter 13, if he leads you to other gods whom you have not known, you're not to listen to him. Mm -hmm. He's not a prophet of me. Okay, So we have the Bible. The Bible has consistently said throughout the years, that there's only one true God. Jesus said this very clearly mm -hmm. in John chapter 17, verse 3. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 43, verse 10 says, mm -hmm. Hear my witnesses, saith the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know, believe, understand that I am he. Before me there was no God form, nor shall there be yeah, after me. me. Mm -hmm. Chapter 44 says, I'm the first, I'm the last. Beside me there is no God. Right. Verse 8, he says, is there a God beside me? God in all his infinite knowledge says, I don't know of any. I don't know right? of any. And, and if there it, was, he'd know it, right? right? Right, Now, in verse 24, he says, I am the Lord who maketh all things, that stretch forth the heavens alone, mm -hmm. who spread abroad the earth by all myself. By myself. Psalms 90 verse 2, God says that he is God from everlasting to everlasting. Mm -hmm. Now Joseph Smith comes along and says, no, nah, actually God had to bow down and follow some God before right, him right. before he could become a God for us. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So God actually is one God among many gods, but we don't have anything to do with those other gods out there. They're right. gods for other worlds, but we have our God for and us. And that's divide, defying Deuteronomy 13. Exactly. That's my point. So if God has given us a basis in his word of who he is, we're not to listen to these other so-called prophets that come along and say, number one, ah, God's really a man who had to grow up to become a God just like us, and we can grow up to become gods just like him. Okay? We don't believe mm -hmm. he's a prophet of God. And number two, if these guys are saying, Actually, you can go ahead and enter into polygamous relationships. Well, that's how you become a god, yeah. is to enter into polygamy. Exactly. But look, if they're already damned in not knowing who God is and they're teaching a false god, there's no reason at all to be believing them when they say that, well, that's just right. enter into polygamous relationships and you can grow up to become a god yourself. That's, that's absolutely right. In, in Also in this um, uh, review... You talked about a polygamous man. In the show, they talk about that a polygamous man cares for his wife if he cares for her. Yeah. He's going to show it by disciplining her selfish feelings of jealousy, which must be overcome for her to become a worthy servant yeah. of the Lord. And in, in that discipline, what he's going to do is bring other wives into the equation so that so he's testing her with more to make her jealous, yeah, and 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 that that uh, that just drives me nuts to even to listen to that. What what about the man exactly. when he gets jealous? Do they get to bring another well, man that's, into the that's, equation? Well, that was exactly my point in that review. I mean, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. It is. If if the goal is to get the jealousy feelings under control with the wife. Well, the husbands, they also deal with jealousy feelings as well. Yeah. So why don't the wives start bringing some husbands in? 
Remember right. Sister Wise? We talked about him yeah, on the last show, right. Cody Brown. Yeah. And Mary, his first wife, had asked him what he would think if she went out and took other men. Oh. And he about blew his, his lid on that, that one. one. And he said, oh, that's disgusting. I can't even think about it. Yeah. And, and, and well, you, that's exactly right. Was because good. maybe, Cody, you might be jealous. So hmm. what? how are they going to discipline yeah. him from his jealous feelings? Yeah, well... Uh, why don't you start bringing some other husbands in? And, and yeah. where in the Bible does God ever say that a man disciplines his wife anyway? Yeah. Well, they discipline your children, you yeah. don't discipline your spouse. <laughs> you <laughs> love your wife as Christ loved the church. Exactly. You nourish your wife. You cherish your wife. And I'll tell you, like I said in the last show, Cody, if you think you're going to nourish and cherish your wife by bringing other women in the equation, you're deluded, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> that is a great way to ruin the the one flesh that God has set up from right. the beginning. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about Matthew 22 and how oh, Jesus taught that passage. there's no marriage after the resurrection. On your website, you said, the question needs to be asked if there are any married angels in mm -hmm. the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So would you finish the question and yeah. explain your point? Well, the question specifically concerns which husband, okay, the wife with seven husbands is going to get in the resurrection. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. Jesus could have very, very easily uh, settled this issue by saying what? Pff, well, it depends on who she was sealed to in the temple, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, that could have settled it. Uh -huh. But look, Jesus and the Jews that he addressed knew very clearly that there were no temple marriage ceremonies going on. Mm -hmm. That wasn't where people got, got married, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, Jesus simply said, that you should understand that there is no marriage in the resurrection. The resurrection isn't an extension of the pleasures and the trials that we have here on earth with marriage. It's a whole new ball game That's in right. the resurrection That's and, right. and in heaven. Now, Mormons claim that, well, what Jesus actually meant here is that there's no marriage ceremony in the uh, resurrection. That's all supposed to be done here and now. You better okay? get it done, done now or you won't. Now they, get yeah, it there. now they say this, okay, but if, if that's what Jesus meant, there's a couple problems here. Number one is Mormons, they're, just, they're not thinking straight here because Mormons know full well that there will be marriages in the resurrection for uh, at least those that never had the opportunity. For uh, those who are worthy male men who want to add more to his mm -hmm. marital unit, yeah, right? Yeah. So this this is just spin mm -hmm. to try to get out of uh, a very obvious problem here because the passage would be flatly contradicting them, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. Now, second, and it more is. importantly, mm -hmm. it's our state of being that's clearly in view here by talking about us being like the angels. See, Jesus isn't simply talking about what we can't do in the resurrection. He's talking about what we are like primarily, okay? And because we are like the angels, we aren't going to be married. As a matter of fact, if you look at Luke chapter 20, verses 35 through 36, it's another account of Jesus dealing with this woman with the seven husbands. And there it says that marriage is only for the life that leads to death, okay? Mm -hmm. But in the afterlife, there is no more need of this system. That's right. Right? Because we're mm -hmm. like the angels. Mm -hmm. Now, if the Mormons still don't get it at this point, then you need to take them to their own scripture in D&C 132 verse 17, which clearly says that the angels are single throughout eternity. And Jesus is saying we're going to be like the angels. Right. Okay? Absolutely. Now, there are two important uh, conclusions to this. Very important here. Number one, if polygamy is done so that the Mormon fundamentalists, they think it's necessary for ruling as married gods in the celestial kingdom, okay? But Jesus, on the other hand, says that there is no marriage in the resurrection, then guess what? These fundamentalists have no good reason to be entering into polygamy today. That's number one. Number two, if uh, celestial marriage is done simply to become a god, an exalted man, okay, mm -hmm. in, in, 
in the celestial kingdom. But again, Jesus taught that there is no marriage in right. the resurrection. Right. Then the very foundation of Mormonism is in trouble here. Collapses. Okay. And so this is, this is a very important passage for us. It is. Because it tells us that there's none of this business of marriage going on in the afterlife so that we can grow to become gods right. of our own world someday to where our spirit kids will bow down and worship us to the exclusion of the God of this world. Mm -hmm. That is Mormonism at its core. Mm -hmm. And that is what's mm -hmm. so blasphemous about it. It is. Because it's detracting worship away from the only God who rightly deserves and it. Who is the, the only one who's worthy, yeah. absolutely. And again, the basic teaching of Mormonism, which I, uh, and the polygamists too, that we believe in Mormon doctrine, uh, most of it, which includes that fundamentalists uh, believe that, that angels were once human. Mm -hmm. That if you die, and or when you die, not if, we all die. But when we die, if we're not worthy to be in some of these kingdoms that, that they've got set up there, that we become angels and we will be servants to these people. But the angels are a totally different creation. They're a totally different form. Humans never become angels. Biblically, you're right. Right. But in Mormonism, they are humans. Mm -hmm. uh, they are humans by their nature. Mm -hmm. uh, they are spirit children of uh, heavenly parents, just like all the humans that are living on earth. Mm -hmm. the, the, prob the thing is, is that these, uh, these angels were once human who were elevated to a status right. to where they can serve God in his, the celestial kingdom, mm -hmm. but they are not, as DNC 132 verse 17 says, they are not married throughout mm -hmm. eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because a practice like polygamy, and this goes into a whole new type of discussion here. Um, so let's open up the phone lines um, and we can continue on with discussion while the phones are, are um, uh, call, while you're calling in. Uh, the number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Give us a call if you have questions or comments about our, our uh, subject matter. And also I would like some input on what polygamists and Mormons think about 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, please let us hear your, your feedback on that. Why, if the Bible says it's okay to, to, to live your life serving God as an unmarried person, uh, just as, uh, as, and it's just as good or better than being married. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Now, a practice like polygamy is described in the Bible doesn't necessarily draw us to the conclusion that it was something that ought to right. be done. Exactly. And, and that uh, you've talked about the, this on your website. We talk about this on the show quite a bit. You know, we still get questions about it. So obviously it's something we need to continue yeah. to discuss. Um, is, should it be done just because... The Old Testament prophets live it? Well, actually, I mean, it wasn't the prophets that lived it, but... <laughs> well, I mean, look, uh, the biblical characters were also slave owners. They were adulterers. They were murderers, okay? Uh, there are all sorts of things. You can describe them in mm -hmm. all sorts of ways, but that doesn't tell you anything about prescription or what ought to be the, right. the case. Absolutely. Okay? Description does not entail prescription. Mm -hmm. So just because you describe uh, guys in the Old Testament, even if they're uh, holy, mm -hmm. okay, even if they have a relative holiness to them, mm -hmm. that doesn't entail that what they did in every situation was good was perfect. or that we all ought to do what they did. Right. It just Absolutely. doesn't follow at all. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll get to um, a further question on that in just a minute. But, uh, you know, you read in Second Samuel chapter 13 where Amnon, who is the son of David, and he falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar. Yeah. And uh, she says that she was beautiful and he fell in love with her. And she was the full sister of Absalom, who was also a son of David. So we've got two half-brothers and a sister here uh, in the story. Well, Amnon ends up raping Tamar and his brother, Absalom, kills him for it. Yeah. Now we get the whole story here. Yeah. Not once does God comment on whether that was a good or a bad thing. Yeah. Now, we know by reading it that it wasn't a good thing. We know that it was a bad thing From just by the story, yeah. certainly. And so, but because God didn't comment on it or it didn't immediately nuke them all, does yeah. that mean he condones the behavior? No, not, not at all. 
That's yeah. the same argument they're using on polygamy. Yeah, I know. So again, just because you have all these different wild descriptions in the Bible, that doesn't entail at all that we should be part of it. Mm -hmm. and, this, and, I think, and I think most fair-minded Mormons are going to recognize this, and they're going to say, well, okay, but that's why we have Latter-day Revelation. Mm -hmm. okay? So they mm -hmm. play the Latter-day Revelation card, and that's supposed to clear all this up for us, even though, like we've already discussed, there's yeah. still problems biblically with the idea of polygamy. You know, we get this, like I say, we get this all the time about the Old Testament prophets, um, that God didn't discipline or rebuke them for living mm -hmm. polygamy. Uh, from a polygamous perspective, that is a huge, and it is a valid, a very valid concern and a question from a polygamous perspective. Um, I wish that there was um, just a, a, a very good way. I, I think the only way I can explain it is, God doesn't nuke us the moment that we sin, any kind of a sin. Yeah. He's, he's patient. Right. And um, in fact, the Bible tells us that God's patience in Romans 2, 4, it says, do you despise the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and long sufferings, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Mm -hmm. And so God not nuking us the minute we sin uh, shows us that he is patient with our sin, hoping that we'll see and come and be led to Jesus who will forgive us for these sins. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 13, 13, or 15 says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Mm -hmm. And that's the important thing is that God's grace and love for us, if he nuked every one of us, the moment that we sin, there wouldn't be anybody left. Because we're all sinners. Right. And that is what I would take would be, if, if God were to do that, that would certainly be a direct punishment from God. We don't find that when it comes to polygamy. But and a lot of sins in the Bible, we don't find that. You're right. But I, what I want to argue is that there are indirect punishments mm -hmm. that God uh, gives for, uh, for going along with a practice that we ought to know is sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, because... It's the principle: you reap what you sow. Okay. Exactly. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna start adding other marital partners to this one flesh arrangement, you're gonna reap the whirlwind. I mean, that's just the nature of mm -hmm. things. But you're gonna have to be putting out fires all the time, mm -hmm. and so indirectly, God will allow you to let nature take its course, right. and you Absolutely. will be punished indirectly by, by consequences. God, by consequences, mm -hmm. in not being able to experience the real oneness that you could have had with your spouse that God originally gave you. And yeah. let's take a look at the news. We see the news and, and even this suicide pact that the Kingstons are going through because of the ugliness that's going on inside the group, the ugliness that's going on inside the FLDS book. You just get some of the books and read some of the things, the incest and the rape and the child yeah, yeah. abuse and all of this. That's all consequences from yeah, disobedience. It is. It's, you're right on. And God will, God will allow us to bang our heads up against the wall. Mm -hmm. And as you said, he is patient. He desires that all men repent right. and come to a knowledge of the truth. Right. Okay? But mm -hmm. as C.S. Lewis said, he said, pain is God's megaphone for rousing a deaf world. Okay? Yeah, and so if you get involved in polygamy, it's a pretty deaf world right God's now. God's not only going to be punishing you, but he's going to be trying to get your attention yeah. of how much yeah. you need to repent and give your life over to him. Right. Okay. And God can forgive every sin. There's, yes. there's no, the only sin he, he can't forgive is if you die as an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And then Which I take to be the blasphemy of That's the Holy the Spirit. That's the blasphemy, right. right. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're, we've got open phone lines. Uh, our phone number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. Um, you can call in with your questions or comments regarding our subject matter, if you have something you'd like to say or, or comment on what we've said. We do have a call right now from Pepe in Salt Lake City. Hello, Pepe. Hello. Hello. Hello, you're on the air. Yeah. Yeah, you're on your I have a question for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Answer I have a question for you. Yes, ask your question. Yeah. Ask your question. Why do you waste your time to talk about Mormon people? Well, that assumes it is a waste of time. And, and we obviously don't think it is a waste of time. We love Mormon people, and we don't want them to be deceived. If people are walking off a cliff... 
which we think Mormons are, don't you think that we would try to help them and not uh, and try to warn them and keeping from keeping them going off the cliff? Why you keeping touch with them? Those people are good people. Well, I I agree. And I have a testimony about my church. This is a true church on the earth. Okay, here he goes. In have the have you heard? You have not. You, Pepe, have you been listening to what we've saying? We did not never talk about another people. Are you talking bad about us? Yes. Okay, well, if you can do it, so can we. <laughs> so you're a hypocrite. <laughs> they don't understand. You're not a Christian. Uh, well, if you... can never judge other people. Okay, well, if you can judge us, then we can judge you. Yeah. Okay, because... I'm Je not judging you. Well, you I'm just said we're not Christian. Can't. You're saying that we're wasting our time. What is that? Yeah. Yeah, you're judging you us. You judge the people, the Mormon people. Yeah, like you're judging us. Judge. So if you can do that, we can do that to the Mormon your, people. Your church not help the world. Well, this we, is a true church. Well, we you think... Ask for the money. Is, is it the... After your show, you ask people for the money for your church. This is what we prayed for. The Mormon <laughs> people are church. they not... What money have we asked for? Money to for your church. What? what? Always... Would you tell me what money we've asked for here, Peppy? Hello? Thank you for your show. And God You're, bless you. You are welcome. <laughs> I don't know where that was coming from, but that was a little contradictory there. I don't know. That's um, a good example of a hypocrite. We've never, we've, we don't, well, we did ask for people if they wanted to help Rachel when she mm -hmm. was on the show, but we don't ask for money. Um, but they think we do it for money. Mm -hmm. we, we don't do this for money. We, nobody gets paid for doing this, by the way. This is all volunteer. Everything we and do so is And so he's volunteer. judging our motives. He's again. judging our motives. Because <laughs> we're really in it for the money. Yeah, I think we could be <laughs> making a lot more money doing other things than this. <laughs> This racket, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, thanks for the call, Peppy. <laughs> um, we have an off-the-air question. What about the passage in the Bible? I think we just, didn't we just do that? Oh, that, oh he's talking about Isaiah chapter 4. Uh, the passage in the Bible where seven women, women will take a hold of one man. If you want to context that, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's, it's uh, they, the polygamists use that all the time. I've got to do a whole show on that one. Um, the, the polygamists use that all the time, but it is not commanding polygamy there. And if you read the context, uh, the before and the after verses of that, you're going to find that that is a judgment on God, that God has have done on the Israelite women uh, because of their wickedness. And he said that you need to stop or you're going to end up with so few men that seven women will want to take a hold of a man just to be called by their name. It never says that it actually happened, uh, that they that they did that, and it certainly isn't commanding them to do that. Exactly. It's a judgment call that God did and threatened them with if they didn't straighten up their act. So that is not, tell me, uh, the off-the-air question who wrote this, show me in that passage where God is commanding polygamy, yeah. or show me in that passage where it's a prediction that polygamy should be lived today. Again, it isn't there. There's a difference between description and prescription. You don't have a prescription there. And, and it, there's and and just yeah, description of what happened and what exactly. go, what God would do to people if they didn't begin um, obedience yeah. to His uh, what He told. God's commands are not to hurt us; they're to help us and to protect us. You mentioned that a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, people like to look at God's commands. Oh, I can't have any fun. Look, God doesn't want me to do this or that. And that's basically the way I was raised. Um, but that isn't what it is. Mm -hmm. It's God's commands are protection. Mm -hmm. Protection so that we won't get hurt by doing the things that he says we shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay, we have Adam calling from Detroit, Michigan. Hello, Adam. Hello. Hello, you're yes, on the air. Uh, my, my question is, uh, you know, the current state of the world, right now we have, uh, you know, 50% divorce rate in America. And, you know, people you know, getting with each other before they're even married. It seems like people like multiple partners for some reason. Maybe it's human nature. Uh, I was wondering, what is what is the ideal situation? The uh, polygamy idea where you marry multiple partners and you stay married, or the idea that you marry someone, divorce them, marry someone else, divorce them, and then so on and forth and so forth. 
So you're just asking what's the be what, what is the better of two evils? There, there's nothing better in two evils. They're both evil, yeah. <laughs> Correct. So which, which one would you say is better? Neither. Doing two wrongs never makes a right. Okay. So yeah. neither one is good. And even, even if one is better in some way, they're both evil. They're so both what's, bad, yeah. So what's the point? I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. Our, well, I mean, to well, be we're, as good as you can. Okay, okay, well, as good as you can is following what God has given for us, and he has instituted monogamy, monogamy as the best institution for the oneness that a husband and wife shares. Okay? So if we follow God in what he has instituted, and we pay attention to the marital unit, and we see that if we add other members to it, uh, it's going to destroy that one flesh arrangement, or if we divorce, obviously that's going to destroy the one flesh arrangement. Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of ways that you can disobey what God has given for us for our good. So I don't care to figure out what is the better evil. I mean, it's so what? Well, we can't do that as Christians. We Hello, thank you for calling TV 20. Okay, it looks like they hung up. <laughs> okay, but line three, we have Ben from Mona. Hello, Ben. Hi. Hi, you're on the air. What's your question? Um, I'm wondering how, like, even though it says in the Bible, Abraham had multiple wives. How come it's wrong right now? Where Where does it say Abraham had multiple wives? In the Bible. Where? Well, it says that each of... Where does it say Abraham had multiple wives, Ben? <laughs> it says that in the Bible... Where, that, Ben? Um, every one of his sons, like... Joseph and all his brothers had a different mom. No, you're, you don't know your Bible. I'm sorry, but Abraham only had one wife, Sarah, and he had a one-night stand with a woman by the name of Hagar, and they call that polygamy, but it's not polygamy like you see today. And Abraham had one son by um, Hagar and one son by Sarah. And Sarah did give Abraham... Hagar. Hagar to be his wife, it says. Sarah gave. Sarah did that. Right. right because this and was all in her mind right. how she was going to make uh, the child come about. And the then she child. admitted after that she did wrong. Yeah. She admitted mm -hmm. that it was a wrong thing that she did. And then look at the headaches that came as a result. Oh, my of this. goodness. With it was such a mess. Still got the headaches today. Uh, I meant Jacob. Huh? You meant Thank Jacob? You. I, thought, I meant Jacob. Yeah. Okay, Jacob. All right. <laughs> but do you read in those passages, Ben, where God ever told Jacob to take any of those wives? Um. Why don't you read Genesis and see if you can find one place, one single verse, where God told Jacob to take any of those wives? And then read the story of Jacob and read what a miserable life he had until he went and to how Egypt. And God didn't tell him to get rid of him if he never told him to have him? We just got through talking yeah. about that. Do you mm -hmm. want to re refresh his memory on that? Well, again, just because God doesn't give a direct punishment like uh, a plague to somebody who disobeys him and enters into polygamy doesn't mean that uh, God is indifferent to I'm it. sorry, I screwed up the show, guys. I'm going to go change to another channel. What's that? I think that he didn't want, like your answer is what I think happened. Eject. They, yeah. <laughs> and you know what, um, Rob, they don't like that answer. Um, it's the truth. It is the truth, but they don't like that answer. Um, I've had emails from people who have told me under any uncertain terms that, that, that God condone polygamy because he didn't nuke them at, the, at that moment. Yeah. And he would have at least rebuked them and told them not to do it if they were doing it. But how many times when we're sitting, when we do a sin, do you hear a voice from heaven say, don't do that, you know, yeah. or, or I'm going to make you fall down and break your nose. That doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. It, they, that is the way God works. You need to understand how God works and his patience, his long suffering in our sin. Now, I would say that even though we don't find God giving those wives to Jacob, even if we did see God giving those wives to Jacob, that still wouldn't prove that this is ideal and it's what everybody should enter into. Well, right? his, Which, his, his initial we, marriage was monogamy. That was his model for marriage. Right. Jesus God's. confirmed that. Yes. 
1 Corinthians 7, 2 confirms that as well. Let every man have her own husband. Let every man have his own wife. Yeah. Timothy and Titus both say that the leaders of the church are only to have one wife. I mean, it's all through the Bible yeah, yeah. that one wife is what God wants. But remember, we talked about this before. Is there's a difference between uh, allowing something right. and actually condoning it. Right. So even if God, if even if we find passages in Scripture in which God does allow, it's a totally different thing if God condones this. Mm -hmm. See? So it uh, sure you, is. you made a great point to me this past week in which God allows for the very existence of polygamy today. Right. It's going on. Yeah. And nothing would go on if it wasn't for God saying okay to it. But that doesn't mean that it's okay it's not what in he the wants. sense that it's holy and it's what, what he wants. Mm -hmm. It was a, that was a great point. He's, he's already said what he wants. Yeah. And in, in the Bible, and all we have to do is read it and mm -hmm. and pray for understanding and obey, yeah. obey it, uh, and that's what our actually our next question was: uh, God's silence when people disobey. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems like that that brings on uh, everybody thinking it's okay um, to to do that, and polygamy seems to be the biggie on that. Yeah. You know, and the slave owners did in the in the South and so on. Uh, you made a point a response in Psalm fourteen, Mark ten. And Romans 3, uh, mm -hmm. would you summarize the point that you made there? And this is from your website again. You know, the point is, is that only God is good, as Jesus taught in Mark chapter 10, verse 18. God sees us all as unclean okay, or unworthy of his righteousness. So my point was that no matter how holy we may think the Old Testament saints were, okay, uh, they still were miserable sinners in need of God's grace. Mm -hmm. And what I try to argue in that online discussion is that part of the reason they were miserable sinners <laughs> is because they did not follow God's plan of monogamy and they mm -hmm. entered into polygamy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. And you can certainly say that with uh, Jacob, mm -hmm. the, the, who this guy had asked about. Um, and we talk about holiness when people argue, when, when pro-polygamists will argue the holy prophets of God. Well, let's talk about holy. What, in the context of, of what maybe they're talking or you're talking, what is holy? Holy simply means being set apart. In, in this case, you're set apart unto God. Does it mean a glow, that you're walking in a glow well, all the time? Well, no, Does it not mean you're necessarily. perfect and no, sinless? And no, no. Um, no, not at all, but you're set apart unto God for His cause, for His purposes, and seeing His kingdom come. They were set apart unto God, but they were still miserable sinners in need of God's grace. Now, I'm also open to them being holy in the sense that perhaps they did reflect God more so than, than other people. That's fine, mm -hmm. but there's a difference between a relative holiness that some individuals that might be a lot holier than us, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. that sense, mm -hmm. and the absolute holiness of God that, <laughs> that only God you know, possesses. I do it, not believe this culture can comprehend that holiness of God because their, their God is was what's a man, an yeah. unholy man. Yeah. Well, that's why God needs to give them eyes to see. Yes. That's why we need to pray for mm -hmm. their eyes to be opened mm -hmm. so that they can see that God is so much bigger mm -hmm. than their puny limitations of Him. Right, absolutely. They can have devalued God into making Him a, a big, exalted well, one of us. Well, and, and Romans 1 says that, that they've changed God, to, changed the truth of God into a lie, making Him um, like the, unto the created things yeah, instead of the, the creator. creator. And a man is a created thing, so they've made Him into a man that's yeah, been created. That's right. Um, can we make ourselves holy? In the, well, in the context we're talking through God's standards, not, by God's standards? Yeah, God's standard is completely different from our relative holy standard. By our own actions, we may dress ourselves up and be a little better than somebody else. But when it comes to God's absolute holiness, from everlasting to everlasting, who doesn't know sin, there's no way we can do that. Yeah. We are all an unclean thing. We have all fallen short of God's glory, as he says in Romans chapter 3, very clearly. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. for, and he says in, in 1 John, he says, if you say that you're without sin, you deceive you're yourself and you're lying. Right. Right? So none of us can say, oh, yeah, I've got the absolute holiness of God. We have the absolute holiness of God that's credited on our behalf 
through the absolute through Holy One only Himself. Only when we who, receive Jesus that's do we right. get that. Okay, very quickly, we're winding down here. Does polygamy cause birth defects? Uh, mm. I don't know that polygamy itself causes birth de de defects in itself, but in polygamy groups, and I'm going to talk about some of this next week, there is a lot of incest that goes on, and, um, and that can and definitely does cause birth defects. So, but the, the act of polygamy itself, I don't, I've, I read an article um, just the other day, didn't get the details quite of that, but there is some sexual diseases that are being transmitted hmm. um, through polygamy and that only makes sense. Um, well, we got through a good part of our script tonight. I want to thank yeah, you again. Yeah, bearing with you last time. <laughs> yeah, we got almost to the end. And uh, he has a support group. Uh, Rob has a support group. If anyone's interested in Ex-Mormon support group, you can go to, to um, meetup.com meetup and type in Ex-Mormon uh -huh. in then Salt Lake City you area. Can get and we the pop information. up. You know, I have failed to mention that we have a divorce care. Oh, okay, too. and then divorce care. For any of you who are going through a divorce or separation, we have, my wife and I lead a weekly on Monday nights divorce care group through our church, Lifeline Community Church in West Jordan. Just go to divorcecare.com or .org, type in a zip code, and our, our uh, divorce care will pop up for you. Okay, well, uh, we'll be closing our show in John chapter 3. Jesus told Nicodemus that in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, he must be born again. And he said, you must be born again. And that specifically meaning, uh, must means that it's something that has to be done in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. We must be born again because we're all born unsaved. No one is born saved. We must be born again, not by personal work or, hu or human effort, but by God, Holy Spirit. Celestial uh, marriage is not the agent to be born again. Neither is water baptism or the laying on of hands or, or celestial marriage in the temple. We are only born again when we receive Jesus Christ as our exclusive hope and source for salvation. Read the, the first chapter of John uh, verses 11 through 13 to tell you about what it takes to be born again. By his death on the cross, Jesus paid it all for us and our faith in his sufficiency is all that God requires for us to be born again and enter into the kingdom of God. It's his kingdom. It's God's kingdom. And he gets to say how we get there. Anyone who attempts to enter his kingdom by works or personal efforts will have the door slammed in their face. They won't get in. In Romans, he warns us that it doesn't depend upon man's efforts. He will have mercy on who he will have mercy. And if he chooses to have mercy and save us by grace through faith, that's his business. It's not ours. And we have to go there his way. And he's made the way. Thank you and good night.